Every skin cancer patient ultimately has their skin diagnosed by a pathologist. Dermatopathology plays an important role to determine how a patient is treated and managed. Today, I am honored to have the world's most published scientist in the field of melanoma pathology, Dr. Richard Scolier. Dr. Scolier is an Australian pathologist. I might have not said Australian the way he says it, but he is an Australian pathologist who has dedicated his life to, to career of studying melanoma. In fact, he is ranked the world's 10th leading publisher on the topic of melanoma and the world's leading publisher in melanoma pathology. In September 2020, he was ranked the world's seventh leading melanoma expert in any field or discipline. In his daily role, he serves as the co-medical director at the Melanoma Institute of Australia, the world's largest melanoma research and treatment facility, and has a clinical professor And as a clinical professor at the University of Sydney, where he co-runs a world-renowned translational research lab. Dr. Scolier, it is an honor to have you on the Derm Club podcast today. I hope together in our discussion, we can continue to shed light on the continued fight against melanoma. Welcome. Uh, It's great to be here and yeah, thrilled to to, um, join and looking forward to our chat and and thanks so much for that um, overly generous uh, introduction. (laughs) Of course. So let's start off by just, you know, you obviously have been working with melanoma for a very long time um, as a pathologist. How has melanoma management transformed in the last decade? Wow, that, it's, it certainly has. It's been it's been a, a real thrill to be part of the journey that's happened of, of this transformation that's happened in melanoma patient care, particularly the improvements in outcomes for patients who've got advanced stage melanoma over the last ten or twelve years. I guess you know, I guess to step back a little bit and um, and talk to, to, for your listeners to get a sense of melanoma, particularly in our country. And you mentioned we have a, we have a major major problem of skin cancer, but in particular melanoma, um, we have the highest incidence of melanoma anywhere in the world. Um, melanoma is the third most common cause of cancer overall, but it's the commonest cancer in young adults in our country and the commonest cause of cancer death. Uh, one Australian is diagnosed with melanoma every 30 minutes and one Australian dies from melanoma every seven hours. And um, at Melanoma Institute Australia, our goal is to deliver on zero deaths from melanoma. So we, we have a, a range of strategies to, to try and get us there. Um, but but the, you know, time is of the essence. We need to do more. Yeah, as you say, we have had great progress over the last uh, decade, but um, still 50% of people with advanced disease are dying of their disease. So uh, we, we have to do more. And, and in particular, uh, funding is so critical and, 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 and particularly from not just research, but public health funding to, to prevention, as well as early and accurate diagnosis, as well as research. So in our country, we, we've estimated that unless the government well, there's an opportunity for government to invest to make a difference, and uh, if they don't do that over the next decade, there'll be a um, 2,000 Australians will be di- 200,000 Australians will be diagnosed with melanoma in the next five years, and um, sorry, 18,000 Australians will be di- more Australians will be diagnosed, 200,000 people will die, and it'll cost our community more than eight billion. Uh, Australian dollars so we, we have to do more and and, and that's why me and the, our, our incredible team at Melanoma Institute Australia are so dedicated for this this fight and to deliver on our goal um, so everyone really needs to join the fight it's a joint effort yeah and I, I think um, getting the message out into the community I think you know prevention is better than cure so um, telling people about the, the dangers of excessive exposure of their skin to ultraviolet light, particularly if people like like you and me with pale skin, who when we spend uh, expose our skin to the to the um, ultraviolet light, we're, you know we're we're putting ourselves at risk. We, we we're not party poopers, you know. We still mm-hmm. want people to have fun, enjoyable, and active lifestyles, but make sensible decisions. So in Australia, we were in the 1980s, we had a public health campaign called the Slip Slop Slap campaign. So slip on a shirt, slap on um, 
<laughs> I get it wrong sometimes. Put on a hat, put on a shirt, and um, and lop on some sunscreen. But now that's expanded to include seek the shade and and wear some sunglasses. So slide on some sunglasses as well. So that message is very important. And and despite decades of public health advocacy. You can go down to any of our beautiful beaches. We have a beach in Sydney called Bondi Beach, which is you know it's world famous. It's it's right in the middle of the city. You can go down there any any day, even in winter, and there'll be thousands of people bearing their their body to the sun and breeding their melanomas. So you know we've still got work to do, particularly in this prevention space. So uh, yeah, can, getting that message out and and. And um, doing more is really important. What one? What, what uh, I know, I've gone off track for your first question, and, and I'm sure we'll we'll come back to that. But the the um, one program that we've got running that we're very excited about, where we're having an impact, is in high school students. So, in Australia, um, schools in uh, so primary school, so that's young kids up to about um, ten or eleven go to what we call primary school and the schools have a policy which is no hat no play you can't go outside and play mm. at lunchtime unless you're wearing a hat so the and young kids they they basically they do as they're told sort of thing that that but for high school kids so teenagers it's really hard to get the message through and they and with the with the rise of social media and and um image and, and looks being so so um, important to people and and having a tan as you know, fashionable in some uh, senses that people are uh, getting the message through to, to teenagers is is a challenge and um, and I you know I, I don't know if you remember remember your days when you're a teenager and I've got teenage children to tell to, to tell them what to do they don't want to listen and mm-hmm. anyway so we've developed this program called the Student Sunsafe Ambassador Program, which we're very excited about and, and um, have produced some evidence to show that it's effective. And, and basically what we do is get um, a couple of students in from a whole uh, number of different high schools. We teach them about melanoma and the importance of prevention. And we also teach them about um, presentation skills so we get in a, a te- an expert in TED talking and and train them up what to do and then those students after the day they've spent with us go back to their own schools and teach their students about the importance of sun safety and anyway we're excited about this program it's um, and we've shown that it's uh, it's effective so we're trying to roll it out across the country but unfortunately the pandemic put a spanner in the works and um we had to hold back, but we were just gearing up again to start again uh, in a couple of months' time. You know, it's interesting because I remember in medical school, I used to go to the local school and we would teach them about um, sun care and sun safety. So very similar. Um, obviously, it's important to start young. Um, you know, they always say most of the skin cancers you have in your 60s and 70s are from the sun you got when you were young. And yeah. people are always shocked when you hear that, when they hear that, they think, oh, it's not from the sun I got last week. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true what you say, Hannah, particularly during childhood, that there's something about the melanocytes being particularly sensitive and, and they get primed. And, and we know that more sunlight during childhood makes um, you develop more nevi and, and nevi are, um, are, are what... Uh, um, about half of melanomas form from nevi, but I, I think in truth it's important that that um, we don't forget that um, sun exposure, even in adulthood, even in elderly patients, is still important in causing melanoma. So, you know, we we don't want to, people to think that the damage has already been done and it's not worth um, them following the sun smart rules so even in adulthood it, it still is important you have to wear it through your yes, whole throughout your whole life yeah exactly and mm-hmm. i guess the other thing that i find interesting and and um another sort of avenue that, w- that we can use with with um with particularly younger people is that the sun also causes photo aging and um and wrinkles yeah exactly everyone's so, worst enemy yeah mm-hmm. and there's some great apps where you can um 
put in a picture of yourself and and it, it'll show what you'll look like in 10 20 years time depending on whether you've um, put on sunscreen each day and uh, and try and avoid the sun so sometimes that's also that's a, a very a very effective app <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh you know i remember when growing up i always used to hear that in australia people would get skin cancer often on the left side of their face from driving in a car and i i never forgot that because i, I couldn't believe wow, the sun is so strong. It's penetrating through the w- car window yeah. and giving people skin cancer. So if you Google it, there's an incredible photo that you can see on uh, uh, on the internet of a, a, a truck driver and the two sides of his face uh, look completely different. It's just amazing. And, 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 and that's what, that's what the, the cause of it is. I think maybe we could backtrack a little. You know, I asked you, how yeah. things have changed in the last decade, but maybe we can just go very basic right now. And if you can share with our audience, what exactly is melanoma? Okay. Well, melanoma is a malignant tumor. So a cancer that's um, of the cells that produce pigment. So they're called melanocytes and their normal location. Uh, they're scattered on the basal part or the bottom part of the surface skin layer. So the surface skin layer is called the epidermis. That's a sort of watertight covering that goes around your skin. And, and normal melanocytes, so these pigment-producing cells, are scattered along the base of that layer. And their job is to produce pig- pigment. They've got dendritic processes or finger-like processes that transport the pigment to uh, the adjacent other cells which are called keratinocytes, the normal cells of the skin. And what the job of melanin pigment is to do, one of the principal um, jobs is to absorb ultraviolet irradiation. So um, as I mentioned earlier, ultraviolet radiation causes uh, damage, causes DNA damage to cells. So pigment is useful in uh, in, in, uh, uh, reducing that that damage. So I guess what, what happens when you get a tan is that that the body's response to the effects is to stimulate the melanocytes to produce more pigment, and and that's why it has a that's an effect. And um, so anyway, so melanoma is a cancer of those uh, melanocytes. So typically, it arises in the basal part of this superficial layer. Uh, the the melanocytes accumulate. Uh, genetic abnormalities, so damage to their DNA in, in uh, genes that cause those cells to proliferate. And uh, what a cancer is, is when the cells grow uh, uncontrollably and, uh, and don't, stop, don't stop growing. So they're normal signals that come into any cell in your body to, to, um, to grow. So for example, if you cut yourself, those cells, uh, the cells that have been damaged will secrete uh, and release um, chemicals that cause your body to, to mount a healing uh, immune response, also uh, supported by the body's immune system, um, and the stimulus to cause though, that reaction to occur, or that, for example, that's a, a healing response. When the body's healed up, that the, the um, stimulus goes away, and then that things go back to their normal state. So we're, we're, with cancer, what happens you have stimulus to grow, but because it's within the cells themselves, it doesn't go away. So the cells grow uncontrollably and, and, and don't stop. And basically that's what any cancer is. And uh, in, in time, the cells keep growing to uh, accumulate additional genetic events, which allow give the, the cells a propensity to invade into uh, deeper structures so in the skin the deeper part of the skin where they get access to blood vessels in lymphatics and thereby can spread to distant organs and when they when they do that then uh, that this can cause problems and, and ultimately cause death um, and in melanoma so you know for most melanomas if you ca- catch it early cut it out um, and uh, you know, catch it early, make the right diagnosis and cut it out. Most patients will be cured. So in our country, more than 90% of patients will present with what we call early stage melanoma and, um, and they'll be cured of their, of their tumour with simple surgery. But once the tumour is spread elsewhere, then you know, all bets are off. That's where, where the, the, the challenges are. 
Um, and I, I just wanted to highlight that the importance um, for your listeners of um, this this message that that is uh, what we say know your own skin so if you see a change within your skin any change please go and seek medical attention as soon as possible because as i said earlier melanomas that are recognized early diagnosed appropriately and treated most people will be cured the longer it's left the larger or thicker it becomes and uh, then then it's high risk that it will spread elsewhere and that's when you have troubles yeah, I also believe that we have another great tool, which I always encourage patients take pictures, um, you know, have your spouse, if yeah. maybe your spouse doesn't recognize something abnormal, have them take pictures of your back because you can't yeah. see it. And then we can monitor over time any changes. And I think it's so valuable and it's a tool that we should always encourage. Yeah, I love that. Um, I love that, Hannah. And, and, in truth, and uh, you know, it's uh, in our country, and I presume it's similar in the in the US. Um, men are not so good at looking after their health as as women, and, and we, we find that elderly men, in particular, they they often they present with advanced melanomas, and uh, and you know, don't don't go and seek attention early. But particularly, the back of men is a, a, is an issue. So um, so you know getting your partner or um or a friend to have a look at it and and uh, keep an eye on things is a good message so thanks for bringing that up maybe men are not looking in the mirror as often <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah i reckon you're right there so how has management like changed. let's take it back yeah. to our original question how has management changed since you've been in practice yeah, so so I guess the the real game changer has been for people with advanced stage melanoma. So this is melanoma that's spread around the around the body. So um, when it's spread to often initially it'll spread to local lymph glands. Um, so for example, if you get a melanoma on the arm, often the first site of of spread or what we call metastasis is lymph glands uh, under the arm. And then either subsequently or concurrently, it can spread to distant sites. So beyond that, so it might be to internal organs, it might be the brain, um, elsewhere. And, and that's really where it's life-threatening. And, uh, and up until about 12 years ago, most patients with what we what's called advanced stage melanoma, so that's melanoma that's spread around your body, most patients would die, in fact, Fifty uh, percent of people would be dead within twelve months, and um, mm. if you had spread melanoma spread to your brain, most people would be dead within a number of weeks. And there's been two game-changing things that have happened. So, it, it, um, so we've understood more about what the drivers are of melanoma, what's caused melanoma, um, and this has led to one form of therapy that's known as targeted therapy, which can be very effective for a subgroup of patients. And the other um, form of therapy, so the, you know, the other superhero we've now got in our fight against melanoma is, is what we call immunotherapy. And what that does is basically harnesses the body's own immune system to uh, recognize and fight the tumor. So it's those two forms of therapy which have been game changes and have provided a lifeline for patients who previously really had little or no hope of um, surviving of their disease. So that, that's the game changes. And, and, and now they're having effects in, in earlier stage d disease. So um, if we talk about targeted therapy first, because that was the one that was developed initially. So, and that came about really through um, massive advances in research that um, were on the back of the a human genome project where the whole genome was sequenced and we worked out what all the genes were and then that led to new technologies which in the early 2000s allowed us to delve into and understand what were the molecular drivers of melanoma. So in melanoma about 50% or a little less but in Australia it's about 40% of melanomas are driven by a mutation in a particular gene known as BRAF, which is a gene in a in a signal transduction pathway that takes signals from the outside of the cell, uh, transduces uh, them through to the nucleus where 
um, that pathway causes uh, stimulation of genes, which causes reactions within the cell. So we talked earlier about responses to, to things like wound healing. So you know, there's a pathway that's present in all cells. So it gets turned on and off at different times, telling your cells to grow. But when you have a mutation in, in BRAF or particular mutations, they, uh, uh, um, they can cause what we call constitutive activation of that pathway. So basically, it's telling the cell, it's having an on signal for the cell continuously, telling that cell to grow, proliferate and develop a, the characteristics which, which cause it to, to um, behave in an um, uncontrollable full proliferative manner which which ultimately what leads on to cancer it's not quite as simple as what i said but that's the crux of it and um so when when this was recognized um drugs were developed which could um, target the abnormal form of this that the protein that's formed by this BRAF mutation and block its uh, action so this uh, uncontrollable um, stimulation to growth could be blocked and 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 that was a game changer i remember when they first came into the clinic there was, a, there was an oncologist that you know worked very closely with for 10 or 15 years and um and he was involved in the first um, phase one clinical trials of this this uh these drugs and um you know we meet every friday morning at 7 a.m for our multidisciplinary team meeting what you guys call a tumor board meeting and we discuss our most challenging patients and um and you know for years he'd been going you know, going through all the patients he'd been seeing and you know in some respects it was it was like palliative care you know there wasn't anything that could be done mm -hmm. and patients will be dying and his face his excitement about what, what he was seeing he had never seen in his um, career ever before and and to to see that happening was really at the early stages was just in, in, incredible that patients who were previously about to die would would not just be alive, but within a week, they were back living normal lives. They're back to, to working and functioning and, and having fun with their families. And, and you know, this was, this was incredible to be seeing that. And, um, you know, it wasn't all bed of roses and, and, and problems developed down the track. In fact, about half of people within a year who treated with targeted therapy developed resistance. So, you know, we, we, we've got other things to, to do. And, and a lot of those patients were developing were developing skin cancers as a, con as a, a consequence of those therapies or skin tumours. And um, soon became apparent that why that was occurring and, and um, it was figured out that if you block the next protein down in the in the this pathway called the MAP kinase pathway, uh, you will um, prevent those skin cancers uh, happening or skin tumors. Some of them are cancers, but um, so nowadays BRAF inhib inhibitors are combined with MEK inhibitors, and you don't get those same side effects that you that you get. But but still, this issue of many patients with uh, who treated with targeted therapy um, relapse w within a year. So, you know, it, it's a great start. In fact, they're not, it's not all down. Like um, there are patients who have, have long-term um, response and, and don't, uh, don't relapse. But, the, you know, that was the story with targeted therapy. But that, that was the first, um, the first thing that happened that really got excitement in melanoma. It was really the first form of, of a targeted therapy demonstrating that that in a common cancer that um, molecular knowledge and, and targeted therapies could make a difference to outcome. So it was very exciting for not just melanoma but the whole cancer field and and for us provided a lot of opportunities to really understand how these drugs are working um, and what, why and why they weren't working in other patients and to try and improve things for those for, for those patients who, who weren't responding but look for new opportunities to to do better than what we were having already so that was targeted therapy and then the next one a few years later was immunotherapy and, and as I mentioned earlier um, that's where we we have drugs that that basically um, work to harness the body's own immune system to fight um, fight the cancer so you know tumors are smart what they do is 
build, build up a shield against um, against the, the body's immune system. And uh, basically what these drugs do is block that shield and allow the body's immune system to do its uh, normal, normal job and fight off the tumour. And you know, this idea that the immune system might be important in, in fighting cancer is certainly not nothing new to us in melanoma and, and you know, as you, you you see in your clinical practice, um areas of question in a melanoma on the skin, so a pale area developing within something that's obviously melanoma. And when we look down the microscope, um, people like Marty Mim and, and David Elder who, who um, pathologists who work in the in the um, United States, um, including their 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 um, mentors Wallace Clark and um, and others, recognised that the immune system was was attacking melanomas, but we didn't really work out how to harness that immune response. So they recognised that more than fifty years ago and recognised that it was important for melanoma patients. If you had an immune system against your tumour, you'd get a you'd do better than if you didn't have it um, fighting the tumour. So we we look for what we call TILs or tumour infiltrating lymphocytes within primary melanomas, and we're known for fifty years if you had more of those, you had a better outcome. But we hadn't worked out how to harness that immune system response to, to get better outcomes, particularly for people whose melanoma had spread around the body. And then there was um, research happened and, and, uh, uh, and discoveries were made, first, first of all, in immune checkpoint inhibitors, so uh, anti-CTLA-4 antibody was developed or inhibited against CTLA-4, which uh, was shown in, in uh, clinical trials to improve outcomes for patients with advanced melanoma. A few, uh, you know, there's side effects associated with, with that drug in particular and, and, um, and I guess all immunotherapies. But um, a few years later, another um, checkpoint was was identified and drug was de were developed against it was PD one so anti PD one and anti PDL one inhibitors were developed and and they've been you know, even more effective as as treatments for melanoma initially but discoveries that we've made in melanoma are now being um, translated into other cancers and and improving outcomes for melanoma patients. So, you know, to put this in perspective, so as I mentioned, twelve years ago, five year survival for melanoma patients was less than five percent. Now, the five year survival for advanced this is advanced stage melanoma patients, so stage four melanoma patients, which spread around your body, is now more than fifty percent. So, wow! Yeah, just incredible um, advances and. Um, the exciting thing is that it doesn't stop there. So it, it, um, massive changes for m many other cancers, so particularly immunotherapy in, in um, lung cancer, renal cancer, mesothelioma, in neck cancers, Merkel cell carcinoma, and many others that immunotherapies have been a game changer in those um, cancers as well. But in melanoma, what we're doing now is moving that those drug therapies back into earlier stage disease and we're seeing incredible things a, a, as well so in um, stage three melanoma so that's melanoma where it's spread from the primary site to the local regional site so uh, just under the lymph glands um, for example hasn't uh, isn't detected as spreading around the body if if you're given uh, what's called adjuvant therapy, so either targeted or immunotherapy, and the uh, so when the lymph node's been taken out, so if you've got clinically detected or even what we call sentinel lymph node biopsy detected stage three melanoma, which is clinically occult, you take that out. There's a fifty percent reduction in the risk of the disease coming back if you have adjuvant therapy, so drug mm. therapy after. Uh, disease has been surgically removed but even more incredible what we're seeing in people who, who are given a neoadjuvant uh, therapy for stage three melanoma this is where neoadjuvant means given after surgery so pa patients who present with palpable nodal disease we give drug therapy first uh, then take out the lymph nodes and 
um, look at the lymph nodes, we can see whether the patient's responding to that therapy. So it's great feedback for the patients. They know straight away whether they're having a response or, or not. Unlike with adjuvant therapy, you can't, patients don't really know whether they're gonna, it's going to come back or not. We, we can tell them that the risk of relapse is reduced, but we don't know whether they're going to relapse or not, just the risk. But with neoadjuvant therapy, we get this readout at six weeks when the lymph nodes are removed after they've had drug therapy first. And the data that we've had in, in clinical trials now, in, in multiple clinical trials, has shown that particularly with immunotherapy, if you have a pathological response at six weeks, this translates into incredible uh, longer term survival. I guess we've got we've still got data to um, we need longer follow up, but the early data is 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 very exciting, suggesting that giving these drug therapies whilst tumour is on board is more clinically effective. And, and there's a, a current clinical trial underway known as the Nadina trial, comparing head-to-head -head neoadjuvant versus adjuvant um, immunotherapy to, to try and demonstrate conclusively whether um, that neoadjuvant therapy is more effective than adjuvant therapy so that's the hypothesis being tested so that's wow. incredible but but it, you know even even more exciting is these drugs have now been tested in clinical trials in people with primary melanoma so this is melanoma that hasn't spread beyond the the uh, primary site so pe people who've got negative what we call sentinel lymph node biopsy so no evidence of spread for people who've got high risk stage two melanoma. So that's a sort of nasty primary melanoma. If you give them drug therapy, so that the clinical trial so far that's been reported is one using immunotherapy against anti, uh, and, uh, using an anti-PD-1 antibody, uh, that re reduce, re reduces the risk of, of relapse by, I think it's about 35% was the initial readout, but you know, um, highly statistically significant so uh, uh, improvement so yeah these are these are some of the game changes that are happening in a rapidly evolving space uh, over the past 10 years which has totally changed um, changed the field in in melanoma so very exciting to for patients in particular to, to have these opportunities and and also as a as a clinician and as a researcher to be to be able to have the opportunity to um, contribute to that space is is a privilege. It's, it's an honour, and and you know I'm very proud of of what the melanoma community has has delivered in this in this period. It's yeah, truly incredible. And 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 as I said earlier, the 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 fact that these discoveries are now being translated into improvements into other cancers is even better. What is the challenge of diagnosing melanoma for clinicians and pathologists and practical ways that we can help make accurate assessments and diagnosis? I know we've come a very long way and you've shared many of the advancements with us today, but what, what else can we do that's practical? Yeah, I think this is really important um, issue that you've raised, uh, Hannah, and, and it's easy to forget the importance of uh, early diagnosis, as we discussed earlier, um, and this is something I'm very passionate about. So uh, as we discussed earlier, early um, diagnosis and accurate diagnosis and appropriate treatment with those things, most people will be cured of melanoma, so they're just as important as they, as they um, ever have been. The number one thing that we want um, patients to know and, and the community to know is know your own skin if you see something that's changing please please go and get it checked out because melanoma detected early you'll give yourself the best chance of cure and for clinicians so you know you probably know more uh, a lot about this uh, as a aspiring dermatologist hannah is um, clinical diagnosis of melanoma can be can be very challenging um, uh, probably about 80% of melanomas you know, look like a melanoma, 20% of them don't. So they can be really challenging to, to diagnose. Um, what they, that they Most of them will be pigmented, but certainly not all and far from all. So pigmented, uh, a, a, um, a lesion that uh, 
that has pigment within it that might be melanoma, so that can be a clue. We talk about the A, B, C, D, E rules for clinical diagnosis of melanoma, so um, they can be clues to make the diagnosis. They're certainly not foolproof. So A stands for asymmetry. B stands for border irregularity. C stands for color, particularly color variation within the lesion. D stands for diameter. So larger lesions are, are, are more concerning or more risky for melanoma. And E stand, stands for two things, elevation and evolving. And perhaps from my perspective, of evolving is more important. So a lesion that's changing is something that, that uh, we should be concerned about. Um, about uh, 20, 25 years ago, perhaps even a little bit longer, dermoscopy was developed as a tool by um, dermatologists to improve the accuracy of clinical diagnosis. And this has really uh, been very useful. And what that is, is basically it's a handheld microscope that you can put onto the skin surface and allows better examination of a lesion at better res resolution and improves the accuracy of clinical diagnosis. So it means that um, melanomas are, um, are better diagnosed and, and less things that might not be melanoma can be left in situ and don't need to be need to be cut out but there's new things that are happening on the horizon so something called confocal microscopy and other tools that are being used whole body photography as you raised earlier taking photos of your skin but doing this in a systematic manner that can be very useful particularly to identify lesions that are changing so they can be um they can be recognized because some of those may, may be melanoma and they can be cut out early. So that, that's from the clinical side. And, you know, I'm a pathologist, so, you know, I'm not an expert in that area, but they're the sort of high level things. But for a pathologist, um, it, it can be very challenging. And, and with the use of these modern tools, we're trying to diagnose melanoma at earlier stages. And this is, can be where, where it's particularly challenging for pathologists. And, but in saying that, that one of the keys to accurate diagnosis is a partnership between the clinician and the pathologist. And a lot of clinicians don't realise this, but the importance of clinical information for pathologists in interpreting um, pigmented lesions in particular can be critical. So, you know, maybe 70 or 80 percent of melanomas you know, by an expert pathologist, straightforward diagnosis, you, you know what it is straight away. But there's a subset of cases where it's very, it's very um, challenging and clinical information can be critical. So for example, if a lesion's a new a new lesion as opposed to focal change within a pre-existing lesion, the differential diagnosis for a pathologist is completely different. And for a, a, a borderline a tumour with borderline features, then knowing that type of information will, will have a profound effect on how the pathologist interprets the lesion and therefore the accuracy of the, the diagnosis that's made. So, you know, I, I think that clinical information for pathologists is, is under-recognised but critically important. Um, for a pathologist to make a diagnosis, for many cancers, you can diagnose them in a millisecond, virtually, when you look at it down a microscope with a standard section of BCC, a bowel cancer, breast cancer, whatever. Um, but for a subset of melanomas, it's very challenging. What, and it's one of the hardest area of all the areas of, of diagnosis pathologically. And this is because it's not just one thing that makes a diagnosis. You have to weigh up architectural, cytological features and features of the host response, put it all together and make, use, you know, uh, make a logical and reasoned judgment based on all the information available, including clinical information. There's new tools that assist us in making the, the diagnosis pathologically. So molecular tools in particular. So we discussed the importance of that in advanced stage melanoma, but even in early stage melanoma, there are some tools that can assist us in more accurate diagnosis of early stage disease, but they're not perfect, far from it. When we initially developed them and started using them, we thought, ah, oh, well, this will be it, the, the game changer for diagnosis. But uh, like many things, when, as you discover more, you find that it's not quite as black and white as what you'd hoped. And so they have a place and help in certain cases, but they don't 
they're not the the holy grail that makes the diagnosis in in every case i think um the partnership between clinician pathologists is is the key to make the right diagnosis in the vast majority of cases like it has been for for many years so are you optimistic that we will reach that 100 percent survival rate in the not too distant future Yep, I'm. Um, I'm very optimistic. Certainly, within within my lifetime, and 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 um, you know, that with appropriate investment and recognition and a multi pronged strategy that includes prevention, awareness, early diagnosis, and ad- additional investment in uh, in ensuring um, clinicians are up to date and, and managing patients according to guidelines, as well as more investment in research, we will deliver on our goal of zero deaths from, from melanoma, and hopefully in the next decade. Well, I hope so. And thank you for making an impact on this, on melanoma research. You know, without you, we wouldn't be nearly where we are today. And I really look forward to following the advancements and your trials. This topic resonates with me as I was a cutaneous oncology fellow and I saw patients who were on neoadjuvant therapy and cyber knife therapy for um, melanoma that was metastasized to their brain and they had another chance of life. So it's really amazing when you see someone who's on the brink of death and quickly their life turns around and they can live like a person again. So thank you for making that possible. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, My pleasure, Hannah. Great to speak with you and um, yeah, good luck with the podcast and good luck with your future endeavors. I look forward to seeing your progress and contributions to the dermatology field moving forward. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Derm Club podcast. If you found the discussion today to be valuable, please subscribe and share. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode as we continue to delve into dermatology and skincare with the world experts.